Let's all stand together and sing. I worship you, almighty God. There is none like you. I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. For the beauty of the earth, for the beauty of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies, Lord of all, to thee we raise this our sacrifice of praise for the beauty of. Heavenly Father, this morning we are grateful to you for this opportunity that we have to come into your house, to meet as brothers and sisters, followers of Christ, to sing songs of praise to you, to approach your throne in prayer, and to learn from your word this morning. Especially more than all is to have the opportunity to commune with you uh, toward the end of our worship this morning. We hope and pray that as we go through this service this morning that all things will lead to that moment when we have that opportunity to commune with you, that we will focus on your body, the bread that was sacrificed for us, your blood that was shed, and giving us the hope of eternal life with you in heaven because of your saving power, your grace, and the resurrection from the dead, giving us hope. We pray that this hope will sustain us in our daily walk with you, that we will continue to grow in knowledge and in strength in your word. We ask that you would help each of us to be diligent uh, and uh, more so even 
in your study of your word that we might be stronger Christians in the faith, better able to serve you and to reach out to others and bring them to Christ, that they might see in us the light of Christ and the hope that we have and that we can have the knowledge to share our hope with others who are lost and that they also may find that same saving grace and saving hope. Pray, as always, that you would watch over us, guide, guard, and direct us, and keep us till the end. And if we're faithful to you and serve you, we ask that you would save us for an eternity in heaven with you. In Christ's name, amen. Good morning. The reading is from the New King James Version of the Bible. It's James, the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 18. Is anyone among you sick, suffering? Let them pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let them sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call upon the elders of the church and let them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if anyone has committed sin, he will forgive, be forgiven. Confess your transgressions one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elijah was a man of such nature as ours, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. It did not rain on the earth for three days and six months. And he prayed again, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. God bless the reading of the word. Take time to be holy. Thank you, Dad. 
Then you left your room this morning. Did you think to pray in the name of Christ our Savior? Did you sue for loving favor as a shield today? Oh, how great rest the weary prayer will change the night today. So when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When your heart was filled with anger, did you think to pray? Did you plead for grace, my brother, that I forgive another who had crossed your way. Oh, how praying rests the weary prayer will change the night today. So when life seems dark and dreary, don't forget to pray. When An older married couple was vacationing in the Holy Land when all of a sudden the husband passed away. And an Israeli mortician said, uh, Ma'am, I can uh, ship your husband back home for burial to America, but it'll cost $15,000. Or I can bury him right here in the Holy Land for $150. She said, ship him home. She said, I don't think you understand, ma'am. It's going to cost you $15,000 to ship him home when I can bury him right here in the Holy Land for 150 bucks, She said, I'll pay the money. He asked, why, ma'am? She said, well, I heard that about 2,000 years ago they buried a man in the Holy Land and he rose again in three days and I don't want to take that chance with my husband. It's Sunday morning live at Pineville Church of Christ and we're so happy to have you with us this morning. Guests, we hope you'll do us the honor of visiting the welcome table out in the foyer and fill out a Connect card for us and receive a free gift from us. We're always glad to have guests in our audience. God's Word is the all-sufficient guide for our lives. Every Scripture is inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the person of God may be complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. In the Bible, we've been given everything that we need to know that pertains to life and godliness. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3. So we need to know what the Bible says about every important topic, including what it says about the important topic of prayer. And time will not allow us to give an exhaustive treatment of what the Bible says about how to pray powerful prayers in just one sermon. So I'm going to take two sermons, Lord willing, this Sunday morning and next Sunday morning to do this as we consider how to pray powerful prayers and what the Bible says about that. Not what somebody's opinion of it is, but what the Bible says about it. There are not too many topics more important than this one this morning. Every failure of mine is because of a prayer failure. Every sin that I sin is because of a prayer letdown in my life. And every need in my life can be met by learning how to pray more powerful prayers. Two little boys that were brothers were spending the night at grandma's house. 
And at bedtime, they were saying their bedtime prayers, and grandma was listening just outside the bedroom door. And the youngest little brother was praying real loud. I mean, he was almost yelling, and he was asking God for toys and for a new bike. And finally, his older brother whispered to him, you don't have to pray that loud. God's not hard of hearing. And the little boy whispered back, I know God's not hard of hearing, but grandma is. When we pray, we're not talking to grandma. When we pray, we're not talking to any other human being. When our fellows come up here and lead us in public prayer, they're not talking to us. They shouldn't be talking to you and me. They should be leading us collectively in talking to God. When we're praying, whether it's in public or in private, we're talking directly to God Himself. God loves us. We need Him. And He wants to hear from us. Psalm 34.15 says, The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and His ears hear their cry. Another way to translate this is His ears and His eyes are turned toward the righteous. He doesn't turn His ears away from us. He turns His ears toward us. 1 Peter 3, verse 12, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. God doesn't close His ears to us. He opens His ears to us. He sits on the edge of His seat. God is longing to hear our prayers. Indeed, the Lord's hand is not too short to save, and His ear is not too deaf to hear. Isaiah 59 and verse 1. This morning, let's all look together at James chapter 5, verses 13 to 18. We're studying the Bible. Let's look at it. James 5, 13 to 18. As James gives us some exhortations to pray powerful prayers and gives us some examples of powerful, successful prayers. We believe that the James who authors this is the half-brother of Jesus Christ. Eusebius of Caesarea recorded in a, an account of church history that the early Christians gave James a nickname. That James's nickname was Old Camel Knees. And the reason they named him that is because he wore calluses on his knees from spending so much time kneeling in prayer. James, Old Camel Knees. He writes a lot about prayer, and we'll look at what he says about it in chapter 5 this morning and in the other parts of James, Lord willing, next Sunday. Here at James chapter 5, first of all, he gives us some exhortations to pray. And he speaks of the seasons of prayer, as well as the reasons for prayer. Now when we talk about the season for something, we're talking about the time for something. Farmers will look at the almanac to decide when is it planting season. Daffy Duck and Bugs Bunny always argued over whether it's uh, wabbit season or whether it's duck season. So what season is it to pray? When is the right time to pray? Well, look at verse 13. He asked, is anyone among you suffering? Then let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Then let him sing praise. Singing praise, if we're praising God, all that is is a prayer set to a song. A praise song is a prayer sung to God. So when is it time to pray? It's time to pray in times of trouble when we are suffering, and it's time to pray when we are having times of triumph. In other words, it's always the right time to pray. Never cease praying. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Pray without ceasing. It's always the right time to pray. In times of trouble and in times of triumph, it is always a season for prayer. And here next, he gives us a couple of reasons. And there are many other reasons, but he gives us two reasons for praying. Look at verses 14 and following. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. One reason to pray is because prayer can raise the sick. If there's a sick Christian in the church, let him call for the elders of the church and come 
and anoint him with oil and pray with him. And the prayer of faith can save him and raise him up. If he's committed sins and he confesses those sins, the prayer of faith can forgive him of those sins and restore the sinner back to the Lord. Now those are powerful reasons to pray. When the church prays for the sick, the sick can be raised back to health. When the church prays for those who are sick spiritually, they can be restored back to their faith in the Almighty God. Pray to raise the sick. Pray to restore the sinner. If it can do those two things, imagine what all other kinds of things prayer is powerful enough to achieve. I like what we sang a moment ago. Take time to be holy. Speak oft with thy Lord. Abide in Him always and feed on His Word. Those are the fundamentals of growing in the Christian faith. These are the fundamentals of Christianity. I'm so excited as the fall gets closer and closer that football season is ready to get started. I'm talking about college football. It's so exciting to me. I enjoy college football season. And and football coaches all over America right now are talking to their students and their players about the fundamentals. We've got to get the fundamentals right. If you don't get the fundamentals right, you can't do anything else because everything builds on the fundamentals. Folks, the fundamentals of being a powerful, successful Christian are prayer and Bible meditation. Every day you need to be talking to God in prayer. Every day you need to be listening to God talk to you through His Word. If we let down on our prayer and our Bible meditation, we can expect to be nothing but weak and spiritually sick Christians. We need to talk to God often. Speak oft with thy Lord. In the early days of Christianity, it is said that in Africa, African Christians, each one of them would have a designated prayer spot out in the forest. And every day they'd walk a path out to where each man's prayer place was. And he would say his prayers. And if a man had been praying a lot, you could see that his prayer path was well worn. And if a man had been neglecting time alone with God, a brother and a friend might say to him, brother, the grass is growing on your path. Let me ask you this morning, is the grass growing on your prayer path? Or are you spending so much time in prayer, so often going to your prayer place to pray to God, that your path to your prayer place is well worn? I want to tell you something, your spiritual strength and growth is directly tied to how worn your prayer path is. Is there grass growing on your path? Parents, let me encourage you to teach your children to pray. Your sons and your daughters, teach these little ones how to pray. By example and by instruction. Every little boy needs to hear his daddy praying. Every little boy deserves to hear his daddy standing up here and leading the whole church in prayer. And every little girl deserves to hear her parents praying. Let your children hear you pray. And then listen to your children as they pray. And give them encouragement and direction and advice. Because prayer is like any other skill. You get better at it the more you do it. And the more you work at the skill of it. It's a skill and an art. And it takes time to really grow in the art and the skill of prayer. One little boy was trying to pray the model prayer, what some people call the Lord's Prayer. And he prayed like this, Our Father who does art in heaven... Harold is his name. And on into the prayer, he said, forgive us our trash baskets as we forgive those who throw trash in our basket. Another little boy prayed like this, Lord, if you can't make me a better boy, don't worry about it. I'm having a real good time just like I am. You see, children need a little guidance. They need some teaching and some example. Help your children to learn how to pray. James exhorts us to prayer. He gives us the seasons of prayer in times of trouble, in times of triumph, because prayer can raise the sick and prayer can restore the sinner. And then he gives us some examples of powerful prayers. In fact, he's already told us about the power of prayer and at least some of the persons who pray powerful prayers. 
An example of the power of prayer is what He's already told us. It can heal those who are sick physically, and it can heal those who are sick spiritually. Look at verse 16 again. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. And notice what he says at the end of verse 16. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Another translation says great power in its effects. I like the King James translation of that verse. The effectual, fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. The effective prayer of a righteous person has great power. There is the word energeo in the Greek text here. It's the word from which we get our word energy. Energeo. It's working. It's active. It's energetic. There is, there is power. Energetic. And, and a dynamic of energy that is involved when we pray, when we live righteous lives and we pray the way that we ought to pray. It is powerful. Colossians 4 and verse 2 says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Don't just pray any kind of prayers, but pray steadfast prayer. And continue steadfastly in praying, being watchful in our prayers. That means being alert, paying attention to what we're saying to the Lord. There are examples here of the power of prayer. And James also gives us examples of persons who pray powerful prayers, such as the elders who come and pray for the sick Christian, and the prayer of faith heals him and makes him well, raises him up, and even can help him be restored to the Lord if he confesses his sins. But another example is any righteous person. Verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much or accomplishes much. Any righteous person is an example of a person who prays powerful prayers. Then he gives us a specific example of such a righteous person, and that is the prophet Elijah. But notice what James says about Elijah. See, our tendency is to think, well, of course Elijah's prayers are powerful. He's not me. He's special. He's a prophet of God. God even does supernatural things through Elijah. And James doesn't want us to think like that. Notice what James says about Elijah. He is of the same nature as us. Elijah's no better than you or me. He has the same kind of passions and desires. He has the same kind of emotions. He has the same kind of weaknesses and discouragements. Remember when he got the juniper tree blues? He sat out there under that juniper tree, depressed, and just wanted to die. He prayed the Lord would just take his life. Lord, just let me die. I just want to die. He got down and discouraged and depressed, and God had to come and pick Elijah up and get him back in the game and really encourage him to get back into doing what God called him to do. Elijah's no better than you or me. And our prayers, if we strive to live righteous lives and we strive to pray effectual, fervent prayers, then our prayers can be just as powerful as Elijah's. And One of his prayers, a couple of his prayers, affected the weather. And God used the weather to get the attention of an evil king named Ahab. So Elijah said, God, we need to get this evil king's attention, and so I'm praying that it stop raining. And so it stopped raining. And it didn't rain for three and a half years. Can you imagine the famine? Can you imagine the hunger? Do you think after three and a half years, God and Elijah have Ahab's attention? And then finally, Elijah prays again and says, okay, let it rain, Lord. And then it rained. Now, we don't read about this story in the Bible, but it is a story that is recorded in a couple of apocryphal sources the wisdom of Sirach and Esdras both record this incident. And so since James said it happened, I believe it happened. And so Elijah prays for a land that's like it's dead, a land that's like it's sick. 
for rain to come. And the land is restored to health in a similar way that you and I can pray for the sick and they be restored to health. We can pray for the spiritually sick and they be restored to their spiritual health. That's the power of our prayers and the image of this story from Elijah's life. James could have referenced Hezekiah. Remember King Hezekiah? The prophet comes and says, you're dying, Hezekiah. And then the prophet leaves the king's bedroom. King Hezekiah turns on his bed toward the wall and starts praying to God for more life. And God hears his prayers and grants him 15 more years to live. And the prophet hasn't even gotten away from the palace complex yet before God says, go back and tell him, I'm giving him 15 more years to live. All because he asked. Now I'm not saying that we've got that kind of power. Prayer is not making demands of God. Prayer is making requests of God. But I wonder how many people died sooner than they had to because they didn't ask God for healing and more life. I wonder how many blessings I've cheated myself out of because I didn't ask for them. And I wonder how many blessings I do have that the only reason I have them is because I asked for them in prayer, that I wasn't destined to have them until I asked for them in prayer and God gave them to me. I guess we'll never know. That's the providence of God that we trust that God hears and answers prayer. Not only could He have told us about Elijah and Hezekiah, He could have told us about Moses. Remember the golden calf incident? It's only been 40 days since they left Egyptian bondage, and they've already made a God and worshipped another God. And God, the real God, says, okay, I'm done with them, Moses. They made it 40 days. That's as long as they can make it. And then they turn against me after what I've done for them. I'm going to wipe them off the face of the map. I'll start over with a new nation. And Moses stands between God and Israel and begs for Israel's life. He implores God, the Bible tells us in Exodus. Please God, spare them from your wrath. And because Moses prayed for Israel's survival, God heard Moses' prayer and granted that request. Or otherwise, Israel would have been no more. He could have told us about Jesus' mother at that wedding feast in Cana. According to John 2, evidently Jesus begins His public ministry and performs His first public miracle because His mother made a request. All because... I wonder what we could accomplish if we just asked in faith, in prayer. Talking about Jesus' mother, you all heard the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. Another saying that is true is prayer moves the hand that moves the world. That's the power of prayer. That you can move the divine hand of God through the power of prayer. We ought to pray. In times of trouble, in times of triumph, we ought to pray. Because it can raise the sick and restore the sinner. This power is available to any righteous Christian who prays fervently like it was available to Elijah. Now don't get me wrong, don't misunderstand the power of prayer. We're not saying that prayer is a golden Midas touch ticket. We're not saying that prayer is a skip to the head of the line coupon. But rather, I like to think of prayer as like a magnifying glass. When I was a little boy, I learned how to take a Boy Scout magnifying glass and get it out there in the sun and focus the rays of the sun through the magnifying glass onto a dry leaf and start a campfire in Cub Scout. And I think of prayer as like that magnifying glass. It is our ability to take all the broad power of God and focus it in one area. Prayer is my power and ability to focus God's attention in a specific area. A specific area in my life. A specific area in your life specific area out there in the world. Prayer is the faithful Christian 
the righteous Christian's ability to focus the attention of God in a certain place. That's the power of prayer. And it's not about performance or posture. It's about purpose. It's not about how good you are at it, although you can grow better at it as if you will try it more and more. It's not about being in the right place or facing the right direction. The power of prayer is, is not about saying the right words. It's not about your posture. Some people kneel. Some people clasp their hands. Some people in the Bible would lie prostrate on the ground when they pray. Typically in our culture, especially when we're praying publicly, we bow our heads and we close our eyes. But I don't always do that when I'm praying privately. I don't always close my eyes when we're praying publicly. But that's one way that works for some people. But you don't necessarily have to do that. I remember like it was yesterday, y'all, in first grade Sunday school class at Boonville Church of Christ in Boonville, Mississippi. Our first grade Sunday school teacher was Mrs. Juanita Pounds. When you have a teacher like that, you remember it, even if it was first grade. And she was leading us in prayer one time, and right after the prayer... One little girl in the class, Rhonda Sarton. Sorry, I'm afraid, Rhonda, if you're listening, I'm sorry. Rhonda Sarton said, Miss Pounds? She said, what, Rhonda? She said, Mike Eaton didn't close his eyes during the prayer. And I thought, oh no, I have disappointed Miss Pounds. She was the kind of teacher, that's the worst thing you could do is disappoint. And I said, oh no, I've disappointed. And Mrs. Pound said, Rhonda, what did you say? She said, Mike Eaton didn't close his eyes during the prayer. And she looked at Rhonda and she said, Rhonda, how do you know? See, you don't have to close your eyes. Although typically I do that in public. It's not about your posture. Power prayer is about the one you're talking to. That's where the power is. The power of prayer is about your purpose of heart while you're praying. The condition of your heart. Deuteronomy 4.29 says, You will search for the Lord your God and you will find Him when you seek Him with all your heart and soul. You will seek God with all your heart and soul in prayer. You will find Him. Is there anybody here who's serious? Is this all just a social club meeting? Or is this the most important thing in your life? Spiritual pursuit. If there's anybody here serious that really wants to get committed to God, I hope you'll make your way down to the front pew. We'll talk to you about turning from the sin in your life, confessing your faith in Christ, and putting Him on in baptism. Galatians 3.27 says, As many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Come and put Jesus on this morning. If you're a wayward Christian, we invite you to come forward and rededicate yourself to the Lord. Confess your sins just like James 5.16 says. Confess your faults one to another. and Pray one for another that you might be healed. And the effectual, fervent prayers of righteous people will bring you spiritual healing today. Let's ask our fellows in the back to put up our song. We're asking PJ to come on up and lead it as we stand and sing. We invite you to come. Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Thou art the potter. I am the clay. Mold me and make
be seated. Rodney comes forward and asks for our prayers concerning his spiritual life. Sometimes he grows weak in his prayer life and, and has not been what he ought to be in his prayer life and would like to be better at that and as a result be a stronger Christian. I appreciate Rodney's heart and his life and his example. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for Rodney and all those who come forward from time to time. And we ask you to hear the request of his heart. We ask for the intervention of the Holy Spirit to help him word the request of his heart. As we know, the Holy Spirit helps us to pray when we don't know what to say. Father, listen to us on Rodney's behalf. Help him to grow in his prayer life. Help him to grow in frequency of prayer to where his prayer path, to increase the time in prayer and the quality of his prayer time. And as a result, Father, we pray that he will grow in his walk with you. Help him to identify those weak points in his life and address them with your help. We know that he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. Help him, Father. Forgive him of all that's wrong in his life. Forgive us all, Father, and help us to be more of what you want us to be. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Just a couple of things. One, I appreciate Miss Fran coming forward last Sunday to sit with Drina. And I regret that no gentleman came and sat with Rodney. And I'd like to encourage us all to get out of our comfort zone. When somebody responds, you be the one to come and sit with them and be an encouragement to them. The front pew can be an awful lonely place for somebody who's trying to reach out to the Lord, and somebody needs to be with them in that journey. So I encourage other folks to come forward with the folks who respond, like Miss Fran did last Sunday. And then second, I want to encourage everybody to resolve within your heart to work on your prayer life all week long to grow in that area. And then next Sunday, Lord willing, I'll ask how you're doing, how it's going. All right? Let's continue worshiping. Is there anyone that did not receive a communion cup and needs one at this time? All right. To help prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, we're going to sing Nailed to the Cross. There was one who was willing to die in my stead, that a soul so unworthy might live. And the path to the cross he was willing to tread. Yeah. 
pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time you give us every first day of the week to gather around to focus our minds and our hearts on Jesus and the, the sacrifice that he made for each of us so that we may have the chance of living with you in heaven one day. Our Father, we just ask as we take this bread that represents his body, may we focus on him hanging on the cross, the suffering that he experienced, the ridicule that he experienced, and focus on that ultimate sacrifice and ultimate show of love. In Christ's name, amen. Our Father, we continue before you now, focusing on Jesus, thinking about the, the blood that poured down his body as he hung on the cross and what it means to each of us. I ask that you be with us as we take this cup in Christ's name. Amen. Separate from the Lord's Supper, we now have the opportunity to give back. Uh, there's the box in the back if you'd like to contribute, or there's the opportunity online. Let's pray. Our Father, we are so grateful for everything you've given us. We are such a blessed people. and Our Father, there are those that around the world that aren't as blessed as us, and we, we ask that things, money that's given, that it's, that it's given with a cheerful heart. And our Father, Father, that it's given to spread your word, spread your kingdom, and to help others. In Christ's name, amen. I left most of the announcements in the copier back there, but all of those were on the screen, and hopefully you noticed those. And here are some others that came in. Holly Richardson is a neighbor to Bill Brown and Wendell Carricker back there, and she's got a lot of problems in her life. Somebody burned her house down. Her mama is having some health problems, and Holly is pretty much blind. And so remember this Holly Richardson that's a neighbor to those fellas. They've requested prayers for her. Lawanda Gray's nephew, Slade Bomer, and his girlfriend both died in a car accident last night. They were 18 years old. Pray for that family, those families. 
And uh, there is a nice thank you card from David and Heather Freeman out on the big board. And we'll also add this one to the big board from Miss Gwen Hudson. My sincere thanks to everyone in my Pineville Church family for my sweet send-off, cards, gifts, notes, phone calls. They all sure warmed my heart. Take care of each other and continue to be that friendly little church. I already miss all of you, but I will visit when I can. My warmest thoughts and prayers, Gwen. But let's stand for our closing song and for our closing prayer to follow. <clears throat> how do you explain? How do you describe a love that goes from east to west and runs as deep as it is wide? You know all our you know all our fears, and words cannot express the love we feel, but we long for you to hear. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirits sing, a song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. If words can fall like rain from these lips of mine, and if I had a thousand Lord, I would still run out of time. If you listen to my heart, every beat would say, thank you for the life, thank you for the truth, thank you for the way. So listen to our hearts, hear our spirit sing. A song of praise that flows from those you have redeemed. We will use the words we know to tell you what an awesome God you are. But words are not enough to tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. But words are not enough. To tell you of our love, so listen to our hearts. Just a few more. Sorry, y'all. Drina came forward asking for our prayers last Sunday. Frank Felber is suffering with a staph infection. Keith Griffith is in the hospital with COVID. Heather Freeman, very sick at home. Sandy Cannon is expecting biopsy results tomorrow the hurricane victims in Haiti, the flooding victims in Helen, Georgia, and in Waverly, Tennessee. Several children were swept away and drowned in Waverly, in Waverly Tennessee yesterday or recently. Uh, also our Christian brothers and sisters in danger in Afghanistan. Kimberly and Tiffany Johnson are still in serious condition after a car wreck. Jana and Elliot are both sick and Jana is expecting twins so congratulations to Clay and Janet Knox who are expecting uh, twin grandchildren. All of the last leaders and leaderettes are invited to stay for lunch and spend the afternoon working on scrapbook and art activities. And let's remember that next Sunday is our big day. We want to try to have 120 people. Will you invite? Will you come? Will you invite others to come? Will you help us meet our goal of 120 for our special fifth Sunday, next Sunday? And then we'll have a potluck lunch for those who feel comfortable doing that. And here's the card from David and Heather Freeman. A note to thank you for your thoughtfulness and to let you know it really meant a lot. Thank you so much for your prayers, support, and concern. 
during this time of sickness with love, David and Heather Freeman. Would you bow with me, please? Thank you. Father, it's such a privilege and an honor to come to you in prayer this morning. Sustainer of life, the giver of life, the giver of almighty love. We thank you for that sacrifice for your son. Father, we have many to pray for today, like Christians in Afghanistan, or even individuals. Those that lost life in the flood in Tennessee, and also the flood in northern Georgia. The tragedy is too out of life, like the young people dying in car accidents. We ask you to be with all those that are breathed, be with all those that's lost loved ones, be with those that's lost homes. Comfort them. We ask you to give us that faith, that steadfast love that we may sustain us each day of our lives. Help us to treat our neighbor as we should. To love everyone, to look in their heart as Christ did. Forget about their ways. Dismiss us now with your love and your mercy and your forgiveness. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.